Hey guys, welcome back to the Thousand Fit Podcast. Great to be back with you guys. I am here today with two winners. Two winners in life, two winners on the challenge. We have Ashley Kaplan and Andy Doan. Uh, welcome guys. Thank you for joining me. I know this is your first podcast, so this should be fun. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Well, thanks for taking the time, guys. I appreciate it. Um, for the guys that don't know, um, we have just completed a uh, limitless challenge. We run these limitless challenges three times a year. Um, sometimes you do like big limitless challenges with like 100, 200 people. Sometimes you do smaller challenges with like 50 people. This was one of the, the smaller challenges we did. Um, it is a challenge that most people's priority, to be honest, is a body composition kind of change. Some people like want to go down the skill route and learn a skill. Some people um, just want to get build some healthy habits. But primarily people want to get some kind of improvement in body composition. And on this challenge, we had a smaller group. I think it was 43 people. But the amount of fat loss was incredible. It was 131 pounds of fat loss on this challenge as a group and 50 pounds of muscle gained on this challenge, which was an incredibly high number. And you guys specifically had some huge results. Um, you won the overall challenge, obviously, with, with the points that you got. But Andy, I think you lost 10.3 pounds of fat. Yep. And actually, you lost 9 pounds of fat and gained 4.6 pounds of muscle, which is what they say can't be done. And you did it. So you I, I don't know how, so <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> and the war between science you won um so overall andy you improved your body composition by 5.4 percent and ashley you improved yours by 7.1 percent which is a huge a huge number in 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 six weeks so you know i wanted to, to, to dive into how the hell you did that because it's both of you it's, it's an incredible number but first of all um let's talk about how, how did you even find barrels in the first place so i know you've both been members for a while but how did that journey start? And actually, we'll start with you. Sure. I joined Pharaohs early last year, um, or early this year, I guess. And I actually lived down the block, so I passed by it a number of times. Um, during the pandemic, I kind of stopped working out. I have a Peloton, but I grew to hate it over time um, oh. and was looking for something different and a change. Um, my mental health had taken a dive, too, because I was isolated. I was working from home. Um, so... I heard weightlifting was a really good way to kind of help focus on your mental health and also get back into shape. Um, and, you know, I found Pharaohs a little intimidating at first, but I joined and I um, have really grown to appreciate it. I love the community and it's such a safe and warm space and a, a great space to work out. So it's been what, awesome. was the, what was the intimidation factor, do you think? Um, you know, when you're first walking through the gym floor as like a petite five foot one woman it's it's a little intimidating it's a lot of testosterone a lot of men with muscles lifting really really heavy weights and so i wasn't really sure that it was the place for me um but everyone is so supportive those those muscly men are really supportive the coaches are really supportive and it really is about taking things at your own pace and it's you know it's not like a gym where we're comparing ourselves to other people it's about your own personal journey and um, you really prioritize kind of your personal best and improving week over week over your prior, um, you know, lifts. And so, you know, it was really just kind of getting over that initial fear and kind of working through my own journey and realizing it wasn't about what the person next to me is doing. It's about, you know, what I can accomplish. And had you been members of, of a gym before? or um, I had been a member of like Equinox and other kind of bigger box gyms, but, you know, I really at that time kind of just prioritized doing cardio and some like light dumbbells. I had never done weightlifting before. So this was really my first foray into, you know, this world. And then that was part of the intimidation at first as well. Yeah. And we'll, we'll go into this, but obviously it, it worked. So I'm, I'm super glad. Uh, Andy, let's talk about you because I know you're you're kind of an old hat in this game. You've been around on the, on the gym scene for a while. You kind of had a little CrossFit background and so forth um to talk, tell us about that like what what was your experience prior and how did you find pharos and don't just say because of my good looks <laughs> i found pharos uh through emily i guess and a few friends so emily coached at the first crossfit gym i went to probably eight or nine years ago 
Mm. And, uh, you know, like Farrell's is obviously, I drive by it every day. I was like, and I, Justin Givens actually was the first person oh, yeah, sure, sure. who introduced me. And I think I joined about. We were together at, uh, what was it called? Cross, the CrossFit downtown, right? Mean uh, Streets. Mean Streets, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was in 2010. Oh, yeah. 2010. Damn, it's been 12 years. Wow. Um, so we, so I, you know, you always used to tell me I'm at this new gym now. We do a lot of just bodybuilding stuff and my back doesn't hurt anymore. And, you know, there's like, yeah, uh, that, that was the issue. Right? You had a lot of issues with your back. You had a few injuries. Yeah. It was yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, I had a bad back. And then about four years, maybe five years ago, I was cycling and got hit by a car wow. on my bike. Yeah. So it was a lot easier just to like kind of still be in shape and not do 315 pound deadlifts for time or something like that, you know? So yeah, it was, it was a good transition. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of it is finding a way. Um, I think sometimes the temptation when we get injured or get hurt is to just not do anything. Um, and yeah. also the reality is a lot of doctors will tell you not to do anything. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not stopping working out. It's just finding a different way to work, to work out and working around those, those kind of problems. Um, specifically, uh, with this challenge, what, why did you, why did, why did both of you want to do this challenge? Ashley, we'll start with you. <laughs> um, so I think Andy and I actually both did the last limitless challenge. That was my first challenge at the gym. Um, and a big part of me doing the last challenge was to get over that intimidation. Um, up until that point, I was mostly doing train and ignite classes and hadn't done a build class. Wow. And so I needed to do something to kind of motivate myself to do that. Um, and so for that challenge, my focus really was just getting into the mindset, learning the skills um, and building good habits. Um, but after the last challenge, I had a really busy summer. I'm a lawyer. I was in trial um, and kind of fell out of the rhythm. Mm. And so, you know, this challenge came at a really good time where I was like, I need to get back into building healthy habits. Um, and so I signed up really for that purpose, just to, you know, motivate myself and have someone hold me accountable to actually going and working out and tracking my macros and eating well. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I didn't really go into this setting out to win. I had a really busy time this period. I, my mom came in for a week. It was the Jewish holidays. I had a vacation planned with some friends. Um, and then I was in DC for the last week of the challenge. And so um, I really didn't go into this with the mindset of like, let me really try to kill this challenge. Wow. Um, it really was just about resetting and getting back into healthy habits and getting back to kind of where I was at the end of the last challenge, as opposed to, um, you know, continuing down this path of making excuses. So that was kind of what brought me to the challenge. And Andy, I, I know you've done a lot of challenges, right? I think this is your fourth or fifth. I think, I think this is my fourth, um, my third ship. And, and this the first time you've won? Yeah. Like, uh, I think Ashley and both, uh, me and Ashley got second last time, mm. but it was, a. Uh, I just, for me, I do the challenges for fun. I mean, I think they're, they're fun. And it's a great reset. Um, my first challenge was with Tyler and we took a totally different approach. I believe it was, uh, you know, the diet and the macros were like way different. It was really, really, really high fat, high protein moderate protein, low carb. And uh, the first time I did it with Shep, it was, you know, high carb, low fat, high protein. And it was the first attempt of ever eating like that in my life. You know, right. so I, was, I think the first challenge, I lost like 13, 14 pounds of fat, gained like zero muscle, um, maybe like even lost some muscle. And I just enjoyed eating like that so much because I picked up playing like tennis during the pandemic um, where I was eating low carb. And then I started eating 300 grams of carbs a day, 350 grams of carbs. And, you know, mental focus was there. And I was like, oh, let's just try this again. So, you know, I tried cutting. And then halfway through the second challenge, uh, Shep was just like, why don't you try eating more and more and more? And, you know, I just saw the results. So 
This third one was uh, it was more of like a reset, but uh, I feel great. You were eating more calories than by the end than when you started. Yes, uh, I believe for the second challenge, I was eating three hundred and fifty grams of carbs a day, sixty grams of fat, and one hundred eighty grams of protein, and I was losing weight and gaining muscle. So actually, on this last challenge I did, I was kind of eating less to, you know, get my baseline body weight down. And, uh, you know, I was speaking with Chef to see, like, oh, what should I do this winter? And I, I actually have never really ever done a proper bulk ever in my life because, you know, I was pretty big before I got into fitness, almost like 300 pounds. So right. I always had the the mental... Sure. Yeah, where I was like, oh, I just want to lose weight, you know? And yeah. So now I brought my baseline down to, you know, 170 pounds. And I would like to put on some more muscle this winter and hopefully well, that's, be able to cut. You know, that's that's what we always say. It's like you, you, can't, you can't put on mass if you don't have a healthy metabolism. Because you're just mm -hmm. like you have to build that healthy metabolism first, which is what we've done. Because you're mm -hmm. not working that, that amount of carbs, that amount of calories. And losing fat, that must mean you have a great metabolism because you built that. And now you can start to add the muscle onto that frame. And that's why we say, like, if you want to get bigger, get lean first. And then once you're lean, once you build that good metabolism, then you can start to add muscle as opposed to just like adding calories and adding fat. So you, you've done it the right way, which is the long way around. <laughs> so, and I mean, yeah, and like the proper way, I guess people say is like, you know, during the, the winter time is when you really want to bulk, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's it's, it's yeah. a natural thing, and like, and I think I think about it from a from an evolution standpoint. You know, that's what yeah. we would have done when the winter came around. We would have kind of hibernated a little bit. We would have stocked up on the foods. Uh, we would have been less active. We would have, you know, we would have mm -hmm. been outside less because it would have been so cold. Um, and we would have we would have put on some body fat potentially to to insulate ourselves and 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 keep warm. So I think it's a very kind of natural cycle to to kind of go into a bulking phase in the winter. Um, yeah. So nice to have that that break, right? That that break of like I've got to be lean, got to be lean, got to be lean. It's all about being lean, and then to suddenly mm -hmm. have your body to take a little bit of a break. So it's like, if I get a little bit of body fat during this time, it's going to be winter time. I'm going to cold, but it's like all that thing. So I think it's a very healthy position to be in. Um, actually, who was your coach on this challenge? Uh, my coach on this challenge was Mia. It was Mia? How how did you how was your guys' relationship with your coaches? Like how much? How much time did you spend with them? Did you kind of left your own device a little bit and just reached out when you needed to? Or how did that work? Yeah, I would say in my first challenge, my coach was Ruby. And there was a lot more hand-holding at that time because I really needed it. Yeah. So, you know, Ruby and I would meet once a week uh, via Zoom, kind of talk through hurdles that I was facing, challenges. One of my biggest issues was macros. And we were kind of constantly tweaking and adjusting those. Um, and then this challenge, uh, me and I mostly communicated by email, text, or uh, social media. Um, and she was really there kind of if I had some challenges. So for example, early in the challenge, when I was going away for a weekend with friends, I kind of asked her like, what approach do I take? I don't want to, you know, restrict too much, but, um, you know, I know I need to kind of prioritize this and get my workouts in. Like, what do you suggest I do? And she kind of gave me some tips on, you know, research studios early, really set a priority, see if you have a friend that will go with you. And um, I reached out to my friends and one was willing to go every morning with me that we were on the trip at seven o'clock in the morning to a fitness studio and get our workouts in. Um, and then she also gave me tips for kind of dining out and going out and drinking. And like, that was really helpful. And then just throughout the challenge, just kind of encouraging me and you know, making sure that I was remaining accountable and staying on track. Yeah, and it's, it's great because, you know, we all have lives to live. It's not like time can just stand still while we lose fat. You know, we have to go out and do things. So managing in a way that's realistic is, is really important. Like like you said, finding ways, like planning ahead, like realizing your situation is going to change. Okay, how, how does this situation Rather than just like going there, finding yourself in a, in a bad spot, be like, oh, fuck, what do I do? So I think planning and just being smart with things is just such a big part of it, but also being realistic uh, and not being like, oh, I'm going to go away, but I'm still going to train three hours a day. I'm going to eat perfectly and I'm not going to go out. Like it's just not going to work that way. And I think that's 
it's important that when we do these challenges, we bear that in mind. Anything you do has to fit within the framework of your life in a realistic way, rather than it being, you know, it would be lovely if we were all just paid money to lose fat and gain as much muscle as possible, maybe just like revolve our lives around that. But that's just not, you know, that's not a reality for any of us. Um, Annie, how about you? How did it work? I mean, you've done it so many times with Shep. But at this point, are you really just like, you know, reaching out to him to ask questions or? Um, I kind of told him. So halfway through the second challenge, uh, he adjusted my macros to, I guess, cycling. We're on off days, on days. What? Because I was playing so much tennis and I still play so much tennis. And, you know, one day I'll burn 4,500 calories. And then the next I'll do build and burn 2,500. So right. like had, being able to like cycle in at night, because, you know, I usually play at six, seven in the morning. Yeah. So, you know, learning things like, oh, if you can't eat breakfast that morning, have you know, 100 grams of carbs for dinner to fuel you up for the morning match. So like, it was things like that, you know, Shep would kind of guide me through it. But by the third challenge, he's, he's like, oh, you know what you're doing. Here's kind of your baseline. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's so for the people listening who don't know, when you, when you carb cycle, you'll have high days, you'll have low days, and sometimes you'll have medium days. Yeah. And the general rule is, of course, the more activity you're getting done in that day, the higher your carbohydrates are gonna be. And that's a really smart way of doing it. Uh, and I think, um, you know, a lesson a lot of people learn when they do the challenge is it's really about daily activity. It's not just about like the hour in the gym or the hour and a half in the gym. It's about being more active in your daily pursuits, like walking when you can, running when you can, doing stuff like tennis, playing games, just being generally more active, walking more. We talked about this a lot. Um, the difference it makes when you just walk everywhere and just be more active throughout the day when it comes to body fat percentage and general body composition and general overall health it's a huge huge factor you know i've seen a lot of people over the years that they go to the gym for an hour a day for for a year and nothing changes like literally nothing changes because everything outside of that one hour is terrible like they eat badly they don't they just they go to the gym and they go and they sit down for the rest of the day uh, and it just doesn't work because that's not how we're designed. We're designed to be creatures that move um, and I, active. So, well, I mean, for me, I saw where the the whoop. Yeah, and I've been wearing it for three years now. So you really, I really get to dial it in and see my average weekly burn. And you know, like I'm I'm a data nerd, so I just like to like I'll actually sit down and break it down. And say, oh wow, I've burned an average of thirty eight hundred calories a day for this week. Yeah. Yeah, and like you know, some there's when I'm here in LA, there's days where it's like, oh, they're pretty moderate. But you know, like when we were for the pandemic, we were in Joshua Tree, working on the house a lot, and we we're just you know out and about, just moving things and shoveling dirt and gravel, like a ton of gravel. And uh, you know, those days I'd just be moving around, and it was an easy 4,500 calories. I'm like, wow, and like I'm not even playing tennis and, and I was, I'm sure you experience it cutting up mats and moving gym equipment you yeah know, like you you probably burn a lot of calories besides your you do more than an hour a, a day at the gym but yeah I mean I, I, I do you know between 90 minutes and two hours a day yeah. if it takes me and then I'm just on my feet all day because I'm just doing yeah. stuff like I'm on my feet now so I'm sitting down but yeah usually, usually for the majority of the day I'm on my feet and and I do think that's a huge factor um, because, like I said, so many people have these kind of sedentary situations, whether it's in the office or whether it's home. And I think, you know, actually, like you were saying about the pandemic, you know, telling people to just stay at home and work and live that kind of like insular existence, um, it's not, not good for people. It's not good for people to be in that situation where they're just indoors, uh, sitting down, not, not moving. Uh, it's not good for our mindset. It's not good for our bodies. Um, so I think the more, you know, I'm a big fan of stand-up desks, that kind of stuff. I just think the more that we can move, the more that we can, the more physical we can be throughout the day, the better we're gonna feel. Not just the, the better we're gonna look, but the better we're gonna, the better we're gonna feel. Um, it's just, it's just a, such a huge factor in the way that we're the way that we design. Um, what I, I loved about this challenge, not only did you um 
you got the most points in the challenge. And for people that don't know, what that means is that they lost the most fat, gained the most muscle, but also daily habits. They built all these, these habits on a daily basis, like tracking food, like um, journaling. Um, and when you accumulate those points, it translates to a change in body composition. So it's really, it really just shows it works. Like if you do the thing, if you take the time to do these things, it will translate to results. Um, for you guys, what do you think, what do you think were the keys to your success on this challenge? Was it just sticking to the plan and, and doing these daily habits or were there any kind of like eureka moments? I, I think for me, it really is, you know, sticking to the plan and getting the points. Um, I remember early in the last challenge, we had a kind of group hike. Um, and I was talking to Clara who won the last two challenges. And I kind of asked what the keys to her success were. And she said, you know, it might sound silly, but just get the points and do the things and you'll see the results. Mm -hmm. And that really does prove to be true. I think, you know, everything is designed to work with each other. So for example, you were talking about the importance of walking. Um, and so the challenge makes you walk at least a mile a day. Um, I try to use the challenge to reset to the kind of 10,000 step a day goal. Um, and, you know, I wasn't successful every day, but I was getting probably between eight and 12,000 steps a day, uh, which I think, you know, really helped me out in terms of losing body fat composition and burning additional calories, especially because I'm a lawyer. I spend my days at a desk and have a relatively sedentary lifestyle. Um, you know, the other things like you get a point a day for posting to social media, which might seem stupid, but I think it's actually really helpful in terms of accountability because yeah. it makes you kind of do those, do the things, right? Like my friends might be annoyed that I'm posting gym posts every day and they think my personality now is like the yeah. gym person, oh, yeah. but yeah. they also expect, expected me to make a post. And so kind of bringing other people in your world into what you're doing so that they can support you and encourage you, I thought was really helpful and useful journaling also like I'm not a re very reflective person um but I think the journal is helpful in terms of early on it's kind of geared towards setting up good habits and also kind of making you think about why am I doing this challenge why do these things matter um and I don't always take the time to kind of internalize things and it's not all about you know getting good results at the end of the day a lot of this has to do with things that we've internalized over time so one thing you were talking about was kind of, you know, building fat and building muscle and, you know, being a woman that grew up in the 2000s, it really was all about getting lean. You know, I really did always focus on cardio because that was kind of a safe place and a place where you knew you would get kind of the body type that you were wanting. Um, so for me, a lot of the challenge was that the number on the scale doesn't necessarily move as much because when you're getting muscle, obviously that scale number isn't coming down. And so I had to kind of readjust my mentality of like what my ideal weight is because it's not about a number on the scale. It's about the overall body composition. Um, and so all of those things and all of the elements of the challenge put together, I think really set me up for success, both in terms of, you know, succeeding in the challenge and then also kind of forward looking like, why am I doing this? And what are my ultimate goals? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, a big part of why the challenge is successful is because once people use the, use the in-body and can physically see, okay, we can see your skeletal muscle mass here. We can see your body fat mass here. What this means is if we can add lean muscle tissue, we can increase your metabolism, which means you can eat more calories, which means you'll lose fat more, more readily. And once you kind of comprehend that, and once you kind of understand that, you know, constantly being in a caloric deficit, constantly doing cardio, doesn't translate to a healthy metabolism. Once you understand that, it kind of makes the journey, you know, easier because it's like, oh, I understand now. You know, I think if you don't go through that process, you know, a lot of women will go into it and think, well, what's just going to make me bulky? So why would I do that? I'm just going to do cardio because that's going to get me lean. Um, because they're just going into it ignorantly, basically, um, because you just don't understand, you know, the, the science of it. And once you do understand that science and you understand the value of lean muscle tissue and you don't look at it as like, but I don't want to look like a bodybuilder. It's very, 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 very hard to look like a bodybuilder. Well, 
Right. An extreme amount of effort, extreme amount of calories, and extreme amount of uh, you know dedication. So you know a lot of a lot of people that go into it with with this preconceived idea about what weight training does, what it does to your body, and what the results are. You know, if you just break it down to the, the most basic kind of elements, it's like this is the reality, this is the truth, this is where we're at right now. This is what we can do. We can do X, Y, Z. Um, I just think you know if you start from that process, everything from that point becomes a lot more positive. And a lot more kind of rewarding because you can kind of just see the process. You can just see it, see it working. Um, Andy, what about you? What were your kind of like keys to success this time? Um, I think the main thing is having a partner like in your household that's also doing it with you. Um, yeah. and just you know, yeah, doing everything like rolling out, showing up. Well, showing up is number one. And then having something that I enjoy doing, which is tennis, uh, just kind of really diving deep into that um, and having fun. Just yeah, yeah, having fun. That's, that's such an important part of it. Like, if you don't enjoy it, yeah, you can do it. Like, no matter no matter how much you want it, if it's just dull and boring, just, you're just not going to do it. And I think you're right. Having people in your corner is so important. Having a good uh, network of friends or relationships whatever it is, having, being around good people. I talked about this in a couple of podcasts ago, like you become who you hang around. Like if you mm -hmm. hang around people who have like healthy habits and are eating healthy foods and that they're, they're being active themselves, it makes your job so much easier. Did you guys um, cook your own food? Did you do a meal plan or did you? Well, yeah, I was just going to say that. So I enjoy cooking. Uh, the, we had catered fit up until this challenge. Uh, so we had like meal prep sent and all the macros were on there. So it was a lot easier, but, uh, we canceled it because, you know, we were like, let's try, um, doing our own meal preps and, you know, we could have gone the route of let's just cook 10 pounds of broccoli, 10 pounds of chicken breast and, you know, break it all up. But we were so used to having pretty good meals. The cater fit meals were pretty tasty. So, you know, we got creative and you know, made it enjoyable. And we're and still doing it now. We still weigh yeah. out all our food, you know, like because not all of it. Because you were doing it together, again, it makes it a lot more kind of rewarding and a lot more fun. Uh, Ashley, yeah. So for me, the macros is probably one of the most challenging parts. Um, I'm a pescatarian, but lean vegetarian. And so the first challenge, I tried really hard to kind of meet high protein goals by early on in the challenge, eating a lot of kind of fish and eggs and things that I wouldn't normally eat. And I just like burned out in like the first week because that wasn't my normal diet. Mm -hmm. And so I had to kind of figure out how to make the macros work for me. Um, and Ruby was really helpful in that and kind of helping me make easy switches and swaps. So for example, instead of eating pasta, I now eat red lentil pasta, which increases the protein. Um, I ate a lot of like banza mac and cheese, um, and would supplement with additional like protein by adding more cheese to it because my fat was so low to begin with. Um, a lot of protein powder, a lot of like pre-made shakes, uh, protein cereal. So I really just kind of increased my protein a lot through supplemental sources and then made some kind of healthier shifts. So for example, my diet was like very carb heavy, even when it came to protein before. So I would eat a lot of like beans with like rice as my main meals. And then by tracking macros, I realized kind of how carb heavy that was. And so it allowed me to make cuts there that I wouldn't have otherwise kind of thought about, um, if not for kind of having to go through the process of tracking macros. Yeah. I mean, we talk about a lot of the challenge. The biggest challenge is usually for people to get enough protein in. And especially if you lean vegetarian, vegan, it's, 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 it's very, very hard. And like you said, usually you, you end up very, very carb heavy because even the proteins you do get in a vegetarian vegan diet tend to be, you know, attached to a carbohydrate. Um, so those numbers creep up, uh, creep up quickly, but uh, all credit for you for making it work. It's, it's, I think it's, you know, it's a lot harder to do it, to do it as a, as a vegan or a, someone who leans vegetarian. Um, and did you, uh, did you struggle with protein content or was it easy with the, with meat and uh no i've never had an issue with that um 
I, I mean, yeah, I never had an issue with, I had an issue with carbs, you know, because like mentally you're just like. Yeah, I think a lot of people are in that, in that situation, you know, because we have such a, there has become such an attachment to like, or, or you just associate with carbs with gaining fat, like you, you, you just mentally do it. Because truth is, like we talked about before, for some people it is, it is a problem. If you, if you have an unhealthy metabolism, if you're not eating enough protein and you are eating too many carbohydrates, then you will gain fat. Like that, that's, that's a reality. But that doesn't mean carbohydrates are inherently bad for everybody all of the time. You just have to be, you know, smart with it. I mean, it's, it was, it was actually, I had an issue with fat because I was upping my carbs, you know, and before I was like, to stay under 100 grams of fat. It's hard. I mean, I, yeah, I guess the key is just to eat leaner meats, right? It is. I mean, that, that, I mean that's a problem that, that, that I've dealt with over the years is because I, you know, I eat a lot of eat a lot of meat. Like, depending on the cuts of meat, meat can be attached to a lot of a lot of fat, and you mm -hmm. inherently consume fat as you consume protein because it's attached to it. So it's very, very, very easy if you are consuming high quantities of, of meat for your protein source. It's very hard to stay under on on fat as the protein. So hard. Up. so yeah I, 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 my challenges were like the exact different situation <laughs> like andy talked about you know supplementing by eating 100 grams of protein in one meal like i was striving to eat 100 grams of protein a day and right. and then my fat goals were like 50 grams of fat and even still it was hard to kind of get there because most of what i eat is very lean oh. to begin with and doesn't really have fat so i was Kind of adding additional fat to things just to to level out again. That is that is the flip side, but but that's also that's also important because either will work at a certain point. Like you can either go higher fat or you can go higher carb. Um, but both will work because really, as we know, it's, it's calories at the end of the day that make the big difference. As long as the protein stay stay where they need to be or in the right ballpark, you can kind of play a little bit with fats and carbs um, and, and kind of whatever suits your lifestyle is going to be the, the thing that, that works best. If you try and put a round peg in a square hole at a certain point, it's just not going to work. So it's, it's, it's realizing that like, I'm always going to be slightly higher in fats and slightly lower in carbs because of my protein choices. And that's just a personal choice. And that's the same for everybody. It's that personal choice of, okay, what are my protein sources going to be? And what are they going to be attached to? Because that will pretty much dictate that you're going to be higher in fat or higher in, in carbohydrates. And obviously you both find a way to make it, you know, make it work and make it, make it successful. Um, you talked a little bit about this, um, but what were your guys' major obstacles on this challenge? For me, I think a well, vacation. Like I think I went on a couple of weekend camping trips. But it was just something we had to deal with, like, oh, let's just bring our own food, you know? And we actually brought the scale with us and kind of weighed everything out and pre did our meals. And... Yeah, I actually find with, with camping, it can, you can actually eat pretty healthy if you when you camp because, you know, you usually have to keep things pretty basic. You know, you're not yeah. eating a lot of, like, fancy sauces or anything. You're just, like, basically cooking, like, a very basic meat and a very basic, like, rice or whatever. Um, so I don't think... Yeah, I, I think like a luxury holiday is a lot more difficult. To yeah, stay yeah. Other than a camping trip. Yeah, and that's like that's kind of what happened in between the last challenge and this challenge. You know, we had a bunch of luxury, you know, like Mexico trips, and then you know I got COVID, and it's really hard to like. There's just so many hidden calories when you're eating out, especially in you know here in Mexico. And you're just like, oh well. Here's a serving of rice, and you look at the serving of rice, and it's actually three servings of rice, you know, and that's like, yeah, and it's it's always difficult with the oils and the you know everything they they put in it in restaurants, and you don't really know. Um, so when when you're when you're trying to be aware of calories, and you're you're basically guessing at a certain point, like I don't know what the hell's this thing, like I don't know what's in sauce, I don't know what's this rice, because they do usually add you know, oil and, and, and sugar and salt, all these things to make it taste better, like because they want you to have a good taste mm -hmm. experience. And usually that taste experience is at the expense of calories because they don't even fuck about calories. It's like, I just- And then that, that mixed with obviously a glass of wine or two. Right. Yeah. Like margaritas, glass of wine. And like, I don't drink a ton, so I mean, and I feel like I'm getting older now, but two or three glasses of wine, I definitely feel it the next morning. Oh, and, sure. yeah. and then, yeah, and then you just like, Obviously, you want to eat something that's unhealthy when you're 
not feeling right great or forcing yourself to work out the next morning when you've gone out the night before drinking and yeah thirties and you can't recover like you used to. So, yeah, I mean, I think my challenges were the same as Andy's. I had a lot of, I had visitors in town. I had a number of trips. I had a work trip and like, they weren't trips where I could really bring my own food. They were all on the other side of the country. And so just kind of trying to get through it and eat the best I could. Um, and I think, you know, learning to make smart choices at restaurants and Mia really helped me with that kind of you know, picking the more simple things on the menu and realizing like, just because it's on the plate, you don't have to eat all of it. So if they give you a ton of rice, kind of when, when it comes out, kind of mentally portioning it in your mind beforehand saying, I'm going to eat this much. Um, I I found that to be really useful. And, um, and then also knowing like when you could, you know, have a cheat meal and I don't like to call them that, but like, you know, if I'm on vacation, like For a weekend, I can have, you know, two more lavish dinners as long as I make healthier choices early in the day and make sure I get in my workouts and I'm getting in steps. Um, So not having such a rigid mentality about it. um, I thought doing the challenge, obviously, during this time was going to be really, really difficult and kind of set me back. But I think it actually was helpful because this, like you said earlier, it's real life. And like knowing that I could do and accomplish this with the circumstances I had it's hard to make excuses going forward. Mm. Did, you, did you both go into it allowing yourself cheat meals from the outset? Did you go into it thinking, I'm not going to allow myself one cheat meal a week? Or did I didn't know? have any particular rules. I think, you know, I started early in the challenge with meal planning, which I think is really helpful and useful and kind of plotting out what I was planning to eat for the week. Um, but, you know, if some social obligation or something comes up, I like to be flexible and leave room for those things, um, but you know, not necessarily indulge on my own and say like, on Friday, no matter what, at dinner time, I'm going to have this pizza that I really want or something. So I kind of save those for like social occasions and going out with friends as opposed to building in cheat meals myself. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Andy? Um. I guess actually on the first day of the challenge, we had this family reunion kind of like with a few of my cousins planned already. And it was at a Korean barbecue. Um, And I guess that was my only cheat meal for the whole challenge. But it was just one of those things where everything that we cooked was kind of like, you know, was up to tasted great. And we weren't really like craving anything. But I actually brought a scale with me to Korean barbecue. I've only done that once. I just, I just wanted to know like yeah. how much I'm actually eating. Like this is four ounces of meat yeah. and I way over, but I prepared myself. I worked, you know, I did build, I worked out, I played like four hours of tennis and I went into Korean barbecue knowing that I already burned 5,500 calories. Yeah. Um, I often like, you know, save your cheat mouse for the biggest days. Yeah. Uh, you know, a leg day or a big like circuit day or you know th- these are days when you just know you're gonna burn a lot of calories that's the time to do cheat meal um i wanted to ask you guys about water and supplements uh did you guys take any supplements and how were your hydration levels um i took a multivitamin fish oil with what i usually take uh and this stuff or like my joints because I play so much tennis that Emily recommended, like glucosamine. Yeah, on joint. Mother. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't know if I feel a difference with right. all that. Talks and yeah. yeah. But the water, I definitely drink a, about a gallon a day of water. Yeah. What about you, Ashley? I didn't do any supplements other than the protein powder. I think integrating that alone has always been a challenge. Um, and then in terms of hydration, I'm really, really bad at hydrating. I think on a given day, I probably don't have water until like lunchtime. Um, last challenge, I bought one of these like giant water bottles. Yeah. And so I try to, you know, get to the level where I drink one of those a day. I think I'm actually supposed to drink two. Sometimes I'm successful. Sometimes I'm not, but you know, thinking about it and being kind of mentally aware of about how, of how much water I'm drinking is useful. And I think, you know, working out a lot also kind of forces you to drink more water because 
you're yeah. sweating. And, yeah. yeah. So it's useful in that respect, but I know that I can still do better in terms of hydration. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good thing. Cause a lot of people like reach for supplements first. They think, Oh, I, I, I'm going to lose weight. I need to take some supplements. And really, you know, there's so, so much of it is, is food is working out is, is act being active, everything we've talked about. And so little of it comes down to supplements. You know, they maybe give you a one, one or 2% advantage, maybe at the top end. And like Annie was saying, like, it's hard to even know at that point whether they did anything. So yeah. I, mean, I, I actually took uh, last challenge. I started taking five milligrams, five milligrams of creatine a day. I don't really notice the difference. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know. I mean, I take creatine every day, but it's like you know, scientifically, it's been shown to work. But it's not like because it doesn't give you anything. Like it doesn't give you a buzz like caffeine yeah. does. It doesn't give you any kind of sensation. So mm -hmm. you just, like maybe it's working. Maybe it's not. Maybe my workouts are better. better. Is it psychosomatic? I don't know. Maybe, um, but, you know, people definitely put too much of their emphasis on supplements because it's a, it's a marketing thing, right? It's an industry. It's a, it's a billion dollar industry that, that, that wants to keep churning out. So it's like, you know, you're not going to get these results unless you take this supplement. It's like, ah, mm. I, I always think of it more like supplements really should be more for health than for like body fat and, and muscle gain because the truth is, if it really did work that well, it would be banned. <laughs> <laughs> because anything that works that well is basically, you know, it's there at that point. But yeah, I think it's uh, something that people do get carried away with. And the reality is we do so much with just, uh, a good diet and, and uh, you know, solid activity. Um, we talked about obstacles. Let's talk about rewards. Like, you know, obviously you guys won. But what's your what what do you feel? Like what's what's the biggest kind of takeaway for you guys now as you move forward? Um, I well, I was talking to Emily about this too. I feel like the challenge actually starts now. Uh after the challenge. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do the next one, depending on I mean, hopefully I don't feel like I need to. But like staying consistent after the challenge is gonna be the biggest challenge of them all, you know. Yeah. Through the holidays and all that. Um, but what was your question? The rewards? Yeah, yeah. What, what's your biggest kind of reward? Like, obviously, like, you know, it's not the backpack you win and it's not the, you know, yeah. discount on membership. Backpack was pretty cool. So I don't know. Yeah, but it's, but, yeah. But what, what are you, um, what are you proud of? Like, what are you proud of? You must be proud. You know, the thing that I'm always most proud of is kind of proving to myself that I, can do these things yeah. that I can be consistent that despite kind of challenges or obstacles, I can get the workouts in. I think the thing I was most proud of during the challenge is when I had to go to DC for a few days for work. Um, you know, I was on East Coast time and yet I was waking up at six o'clock in the morning to get to a gym class at 6 30 and getting my workout in before I started work for the day and just showing to myself that I can do those things. Um, and then I mean actually winning is pretty motivating. I think kind of, you know, seeing the shifts and the changes in your body that you're not necessarily experiencing or realizing at the time, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't necessarily see it. And then kind of the in-body scans really show you where things are going. Um, so just seeing what I could do and what I can accomplish and knowing that, you know, if I continue down this path, I can, you know, continue making strides and um, also, I mean, like non-scale victories is kind of seeing my progress in the gym. Um, you know, Robert's always kind of pushing me to add more weight and keeps telling me like, you know, you are much further than you were when you first got to the gym and it's true. And like mentally realizing that and mentally realizing kind of what I can do and that I can reach for heavier weights, um, and kind of seeing the shifts and changes in my form in my various lifts. Um, also I think our, our victories and things that I'm hoping will continue to motivate me, like Andy said, through the holidays and yeah. get to a place where I don't feel like come February, like I really, really need this challenge again to reset. Yeah. But it's nice to know. It's nice to know that when you need to, you can do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think a lot of people fall off the wagon and fall out of fitness when they like kind of lose their way. And like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Like, I don't know how to do this anymore. 
But when you go through a process like that and you, you, you've learned the skills, you kind of know how it's done, I think that's kind of reassuring going into the, the kind of holiday season because the likelihood is you probably will gain a little bit of body fat, maybe. You know, this is just something that, that will probably happen. But the, the key thing is to not let it, like, take its toll on you mentally and be like, oh, my God, this is a disaster. I'm destroyed. It's like, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Like, I know that I can change things around. I can, you know... When it's time to stop, it's time to stop, and then you, you kind of move on to the next phase. Um, kind of like what we're talking about before, it's it's good, it's healthy for us to kind of have cycles. I think if we try and stay perfect, you know, 365 days a year, you know, it's it's just a completely unrealistic, you know, expectation for ourselves. So we need to allow ourselves to kind of like ebb and flow just a little bit. Um, you know, no one's you know at their peak the whole the whole year round. Um, and Annie, you talked about like you're going to probably go through a little bit of a, a mass phase going into the, the, the holiday season and uh, into the winter. Um, and I want to ask both of you, like, where do you, where do you go from here? So, Annie, you're going to be into the side of like gaining some muscle in the next kind of few months. Ashley, what, what are your kind of like immediate goals for the future for kind of like next year? Yeah, um, I want to continue to kind of bring my body fat percentage back. So I think that is, you know, sustained muscle growth and then also continuing to take off fat. Um, so I think I'm at like 25% body fat now and I'd like to get to the kind of 18 to 20% range in the next few months. Um, and I think kind of taking it in increments and kind of seeing how I feel about my body at the time and where I want to go next makes the most sense as opposed to kind of trying to have long-term goals that are less sustainable and, um, you know, feeling like I'm not making progress towards them. So. Yeah, that's smart. I, I think it's, it's really important that people, people set these realistic expectations and realistic goals that are not like, you know, too, too far away and too like lofty, because if it's too lofty, you just lose, you lose faith in it. You lose direction with it. If, it, you, if you set like achievable goals in the near future, Tick off that box and then you move on. You tick off that box and you move on. So a lot, a lot healthier and a lot more realistic, and, and you're a lot less likely to lose motivation when you do it that way, because you set a target, you meet it. You set a target, you meet it, and you you move on. One success breeds another kind of uh, situation, which is the way to go. Um, one last thing uh, before we go, so no, Andy, you've got a hard out. Um, what advice? would you give for, for challenges in the future? Anybody that's thinking about doing something like this, anybody, we, we talked about a, a little bit of gym apprehension, Ashley, in the beginning, about um, being a bit intimidated. What advice would you give uh, future challengers who are looking to get the same kind of success that you guys have had? I would say, I mean, first of all, on the gym, gym intimidation point, like this challenge is for everyone. It doesn't really matter where you are in your fitness journey. I think I've, seen people succeed in various stages. Um, and a lot of people that succeed are kind of the people that are early to the fitness journey because you have the most kind of ability to change your body shape. Um, and then just kind of carve out the time to do it. If you're making this commitment, you're making the financial commitment to the challenge, just do the things, put in the work, put in the effort and prioritize it. Um, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. I think that was something we kind of talked about before, but, you know, get in your one hour a day of a workout. Like anyone can do that. Even if you're super busy, you have, you know, mornings, you have nights, just make a commitment to yourself, to improving yourself and use this time to kind of build those healthy habits so that when the challenge is over, you're in a place where you've set yourself up to succeed. Awesome. Um, I would say... If you are feeling like nervous or reluctant on doing it, do it with your partner. Or if you don't have a partner, make a friend at the gym and do it with a friend because it's always easier to do something with a friend when you guys are both in it together. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because we talk a lot about community, but if you can make that, you know, we have the community as a whole, but then mm -hmm. when you have a close knit circle as well, it can be really helpful when you're trying to do something like this. Um, we all need the positive voices around us. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, congratulations again. Super proud of you guys. Amazing results, amazing achievement. Um, I look forward to seeing where you guys uh, go next year. And I'm sure you'll help like, other people 
um, achieve similar success that, that you guys have had when they when they ask you because you know you are now authorities on this subject so <laughs> possibility to pay it forward. Uh, guys, if you like this uh, podcast, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you subscribe to the podcast, please like, please share, do all that good stuff. It's really helpful for us as a business. Um, just helps us grow and helps us stay alive. So um, thanks for listening today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks again, guys. You guys are awesome. And I'll see you at the gym. Thank you.